You're in the right place at the right time with the right organization. So congratulations. Okay, for those who have not either read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or Business of the 21st Century, let's give a little bit of my background. My name is Robert Kiyosaki. It sounds, it sounds like Kawasaki. Yeah. I wish it was Kawasaki. Yeah, I'd be some worthless playboy in Tokyo, you know, spending daddy's money. But uh, I'm fourth generation Japanese American, which means I don't speak Japanese. So please don't come up and practice on me. <laughs> anyway, um, so I was born in Hawaii, and my father, the story of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the true story, my dad, my real dad, was the head of education for the state. Very good man for a Japanese. He was fairly tall. He was six foot four. Um, I'm the smallest in my family. But, uh, and my dad was a PhD. He graduated from university in less than two years and went on to Stanford, Northwestern, and University of Chicago. But I call him my poor dad very simply because he was a hardworking man, but no matter how hard he worked, he never got ahead. How many people have parents like that? Yeah. And one of the reasons for that is because our schools have no financial education. Our schools just tell you to go to school and work for money. So you work for guys like me. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it, but uh, I don't pay much. <laughs> but anyway, um, that was my poor dad. My rich dad was my best friend's father, and we lived in a little town called Hilo, Hawaii, and there was not much to do there. So starting at the age of nine, I used to go to my rich dad's office and he would teach me about business. And so, that, and so what you guys are doing here is not much different than what I was doing. I want to hang out with people who know where they're going. So that's why you're, I've watched some of the speakers up here. You know, they've got swag, man. They have got it. They're, <laughs> they're really good. So uh, I would go and listen to my rich dad at age nine and he began teaching me why the rich get richer. That was my only question as a kid. I wasn't really that interested in money, but I was just kind of curious, you know, how come some people are rich and why are most people poor? That was a simple question. And every time I asked my school teacher, I said, hey, what are we going to learn about money? And the teacher would say, never. <laughs> so well, why am I in school? And I said, well, all you have to do is go to school Get good what? Grades. And you'll get a good job. And you can work <laughs> and die. <laughs> we must have gone to the same school. You know? <laughs> so it was just really <coughs> curious. Why are some people rich and why are some people poor? That was the only thing. So what I'll be talking to you today about is just some of the lessons my rich dad taught me lessons that guided me all my life because my poor dad left me with nothing, which was good. And at first I was angry, but it turned out it was the best thing I could have done for me. If he had given me money, I would never have learned what I had to learn. So what I'm going to be talking to you today about <coughs> is some of the lessons that are in front of you. But if I can encourage you to keep going, you will get to a place that very few people ever get to. So that's why I'm here, and I want to thank you guys for being here, and congratulations on your choice here. So I'm going to talk about um, where you guys are at, or where we're all at today. My second book was a book called The Cash Flow Quadrant. Anybody have a chance to read that one? Yeah. I think it's the possibly my most important book because it gives people a chance to figure out where they are. So when I was about nine or ten years old, my rich dad would just simply draw this diagram here, and he would say E S B I. And what he was saying was that in the world of business, there are four different types of people. E stands for employee, 
<clears throat> S stands for small business, self-employed, or specialists like doctors and lawyers. B stands for big business, 500 employees or more. And I stands for investor. And when I talk about investor, I don't mean a passive investor. I don't mean one of these guys with a 401k full of junk. You know, I'm talking about active investors. Most of these guys here are passive. So the reason where you're sitting today, for some of you maybe your first time been to, been to an event like this, is that when you say to a child, go to school and get a job, they're being brainwashed or programmed to be an employee. So when I was nine years old, and when I, when I understood this, every time the teacher said to me, and says, you know, Robert, because I was having trouble in school, <laughs> here's my old man, the head of a school system, and I'm flunking out, you know, having a bad time. He said, but Robert, you're flunking out. I said, yeah. You know, you know what I flunked out on? Writing. And today my book has sold more books than most people will ever see. You know? <laughs> Anyway, so when I was 15, I flunked out because I couldn't write. So the teacher says to me, Robert, guess what? If you don't graduate, you won't get a job. I said, oh, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then my mother, my poor mom, you know, she comes up and says, you know, Robert, please, please. She wanted me to become, my mother was a nurse. And she wanted me to become a doctor, medical doctor. I said, Mom, there's only one problem with me being a doctor. She goes, what's that? I said, S stands for smart. <laughs> she says, you have a good point there. I guess you're not going to be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the good news was that my rich dad was saying, this is where life was found here anyway. So these are the four different types of people, you know, business owners, I have hundreds of different, different companies, hundreds of different employees working for them, and I manage my own money, I invest myself. So all of you today are sitting here with the potential of making it here and here. And you're gonna find out something that very few people ever know. Your school teachers will never tell you this stuff. So you'll find out some things why you sit in the best spot right here. And th this is the reason you're in the best place. Because if you do what my poor dad wanted me to do, what they don't tell you in school, even business school, is that if you're an employee and you have a job, you will pay 40% of your income to the government. Okay? And if you're a doctor or a lawyer or a small business person, you will pay 60% to the government. And they don't tell you that. So you guys who are sitting here today wondering, you know, should I be here or here? If this is not motivation, I don't know what is. Okay. <laughs> Worst of all, if you live in the Communist Republic of California, <laughs> this is even higher. Phil Mickelson lives down right up the road here, Rancho Santa Fe, and he was complaining because his went to 73%. Now, he shouldn't complain because he made $45 million. You know I mean? But nobody likes to pay that much in tax. So for all of you right now who have friends saying, who are still in school, you know, we've got to get a job, I'm going to be a lawyer, I'm going to be a doctor and all this, this is where they're cruising for. And they don't know that. Today, you have a choice. You have an opportunity to make some choices in your life. Say, I don't want to go there. I don't want to be a slave to the government. Got it? <laughs> now, I know there are some communists out there who are saying, well, these guys are cheats. That's not true. If you read my book here, why A students work for C students and B students work for the government, you'll find out here the reason these guys pay the highest taxes is because they're the greatest people on earth. 
You know, when people say to you the rich are greedy, that's the biggest lie there is. Okay? So what I cover in my book, Why Asinus, is to be over here, you have to be very generous to get those tax breaks. The reason I have tax breaks over here is because I don't have a job. I create jobs. I don't own a house. I provide apartment houses for people. Okay? And I don't drive my car with burning gas. And, you know, I provide oil for people. So what I'm saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, in this young revolution here, you have a chance to come here and here. You can make your money here and leverage it into this here. You'll be wealthier beyond your wildest dreams. Okay. So what I'm going to be talking about today is how not to fall into this trap. So how many people have friends who are still in school hoping to find a high-paying job? You know what they are? Losers. You know what I mean? Very good. And it's not me who's saying they're a loser. The tax department is. Okay? This is... And this is true all over the world. But they don't tell you that in school because they want you to have a job and work for these guys here. So these guys here, the bees, they pay 20% in tax. That's huge. You know, when you make about 4 or $5 million a year, that difference is a lot of money. A lot of money. And over here, zero. So the thing is, you all have this opportunity right now. I cover a little bit on this book here, and I'm not trying to pump the book, but I'm trying to say you're in the right spot. But you have to keep your mind open, understand what's going on here, because look, the reason these guys get the big breaks is these guys don't have the guts to come over here. So. What I'm going to be talking about for a few minutes with you today is what it takes to come over here. Because when I, when I left high school, I was really disillusioned. I said, you know, I'm stupid. I had flunked out of high school twice, both times because I can't write, ironically. <laughs> and, uh, but I had, so I had bad grades, but I had high SAT scores. And with that, I got two nominations to the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, and the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point, New York. But that was just for my college degree, and I'll get my degree. So I said, I'm going to go to, I'll go to this military school. So I graduated, and I had a very high paying job. When I graduated from King's Point, the Merch Marine Academy, back then, this is in 1969, my classmates were making about 110000 a year. Now, that's not much money today, but it was a lot of money back then. You know? So I was tempted. I was making all of this money. But I already knew my, my rich dad said, if I come over here, I'll make more money. But make more money, but pay less tax. So simultaneously, that's why I didn't fall into this thing. And I, I work not too far from here, up in San Francisco, for Standard Oil of California. I was driving their tankers up and down the West Coast, oil tankers, as a ship's officer, making a lot of money for a kid, you know. I was 22 years old. Making a, back, back then, I was only making about 45000 because my company was non-union. If you're union, you make 150000 110000 But anyway, my mom still wanted me to become a doctor. I'm like, I'd be nuts, you know? So in 1969, when I graduated, the Vietnam War was still on, and I felt kind of guilty. You know, I said, am I for the war or anti the war? And I didn't have to go to war because I worked for the oil industry. If you work for oil, you don't have to do a lot of things. So after making a lot of money for about a few months, I went, you know, I can't, my conscience couldn't stand it. So I, said, I volunteered for the U.S. Marine Corps. And um, thank you. Which proves I'm not smart. But anyway. 
And then I went to flight school in Pensacola, Florida, and uh, the war was winding down. It took me about two years to get my wings. And I said, what's the fastest way to Vietnam? You know, was, I'm sitting in Florida, and they said, you can fly jets, you can fly this, you can fly transports. I said, what's the fastest way to Vietnam? Because I was afraid I was going to miss it. And they said, helicopter gunships. I said, oh, why? He says, you're an idiot, because they're dying. That's why. We had the highest death rates going. 30 days, we were dead. So I said, sounds good to me. You know? <laughs> so from, from Florida, they shook me straight up the street up here to Camp Pendleton, California. And I spent the next year in Camp Pendleton. I was flying gunships going in and out, in and out, da -da 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 -da, up and down the mountains here. All the, all the hippies hated me, but screw them. You know, I was just flying around the <laughs> hill. <laughs> and after a year, straight to Vietnam, and it was the best experience of my life, you know. Look at the aircraft carriers out here. I was on the aircraft carriers, and we flew strikes into Vietnam. And I went down three times, and I tell you what, you don't need coffee for a while. I mean, it's... <laughs> but it was, uh, you know, I didn't come back all screwed up. I came back effed up, you know, I was like... <laughs> Now, now this is well, this is why I'm talking to you guys here. By the time I came back from Vietnam, I couldn't go back here. You know, I was thinking, if they can't kill me here, they can't kill me here, you know what I mean? And I had this kind of effed attitude, you know, so I went into business. And that's why I became an entrepreneur. That's what you have an opportunity to do, too. But it's going to take guts. It's going to take hard work. It's not easy. The trouble with these asshole, I mean, these people over here. <laughs> I, still, I still am a Marine, you know, you can tell my language. <laughs> Is these guys here need a frickin' paycheck. You know, they cannot survive without a paycheck on mommy and daddy's allowance. That's why they don't make it over here. So the challenge for all of you, you sit on the biggest opportunity possibly in, in a life. I mean, B, BK has produced one of the best companies I've ever seen. <laughs> and if you F it up, it's not his fault. You know, that, <laughs> if you don't have the goal, the, Balls, testicles, you know. <laughs> so I'll be talking about, see, this is your job. I, I want to explain your job to you really simply. Your job is to convince these losers to come over here. <laughs> How many people have had a hard time talking to these losers on this side? The problem is they still have visions of paychecks floating in their heads. <laughs> they do not understand entrepreneurship. They can see a multi-million dollar opportunity, but they don't see a paycheck. That's why they're hosed. Does that make sense to you guys here? Because they see the world from this side here. This side here, there's no paycheck. There's only extreme wealth and no taxes. <laughs> Another thing I thought was really funny this last past election, I'm not political, you know, I didn't care if, if Romney won, I didn't care if Obama won, I don't care. Because it doesn't make any difference. Because these guys run the show anyway. <laughs> but what I thought was really funny was that Obama is happy because I think he made $3 million and he paid 24% in tax or something. <laughs> Loser, <I'm like laughs> And Romney made $24 million, I think, and paid 13% in tax. Now, both guys went to Harvard. Both guys have their master's degree, but one pays 24% in tax and one pays only 13% tax. And the reason is Obama thinks from this side 
and Romney thanks from this side. Okay? So I'm not saying one is right or wrong. I don't really care. What I do care about is what you want to grow up in. See, if you want to do what mommy and daddy did and grow up over here, you're hosed. Because guess what? This economy is going to get worse. You know, there's going to be fewer and fewer jobs. It's not that, it's not that jobs are moving overseas. Jobs are disappearing, period. When Mr. Obama says that they've got unemployment up and all this stuff, they created 65 million jobs, whatever he says, he doesn't say most of them are low-wage low jobs. So that's why you have college kids working at low-wage jobs. Nothing wrong with that. But they don't tell you the truth here. So they, they, they fix the so-called unemployment problem, but they're not going to make much money. In America today, there's 146 million Americans working for minimum wage. That's half the population. 146 million Americans. There's only 325 million Americans. So they all have jobs over here. They're not making enough money and they're paying excessive tax. If they make more money, they pay more tax. That's nuts. That's why I call them losers. So your job is to have them find religion and move over here. Got it? So. So I'm going to talk about four things, four, four lessons I've learned along the way, just four, okay? And hopefully they'll guide you over to the other side or you can help others guide over to the other side. Lesson number one, the word is fail, okay? Most people on this side are taught that to fail is bad. That's why they're losers. Look, if you don't make mistakes, you don't learn. If you don't fail, you don't succeed. So in school, they're still teaching kids, don't make mistakes. You know how stupid that is? How do you learn if you don't make a mistake? And the more mistakes you make, the smarter you get. And the reason I know that very well is my poor dad, great man, like I said, PhD. I stood for poor, helpless, and desperate. But anyway, <laughs> my dad's over there. He is so terrified of making a mistake. Because that's what they teach you in school. Don't make mistakes. You ever watch a kid or a baby learning how to walk? You know, the kid's crawling along. He looks up and he sees mommy and dad. He says, okay, I understand. And the kid stands up like this and falls down. Parents don't go over there and beat the shit out of the kid. He's too good to kill What does the kid do? He goes, oh, I screwed up. I think I'll try it again. You know, the kid like, drooling. The, the pampers are loaded. You know, like this. <laughs> falls down. It doesn't go, oh, I'm a failure. They teach you that in school. Though. See? My, my uh, friend had a huge fight just a few months ago in, in our school system. I live in Arizona now. And he had a huge fight with him. The teacher is giving her daughter happy faces on her cheek if she makes no mistakes. And my friend went in there and says, hey, don't you teach that bullshit to my kid, you know? I want my kid to fail. I thought, you could kidding me. So what I'm saying to you here is this. When you're talking to these guys on this side, you have ringing in their little ears. What if I fail? What if I make mistakes? What if I don't make it? Because that's what they teach you in school. They teach you if you fail, you're stupid. That is so anti-learning, it is beyond comprehension. Got it? <laughs> when I was in flight school up here at Camp Pendleton, 
We used to fly, and I thought I was a pretty good pilot, but every single day. We had a minimum of four emergencies. It killed the engine, do this, do that. We practiced failing more than we did flying. That's why we came back alive. I practiced this emergency, this emergency, that emergency, rolling in on a gun shoot, taking a hit on this side, fixing the thing, and flying. You know that guy, Sullenberg, who was U.S. Air, he uh, leaped off of uh, LaGuardia or Kennedy, wherever he is. The engine quit and went straight into the water. That's all they train us to do. They train pilots by teaching us how to fail. Our school system teaches you not to fail. And that's why you have so many people come into you and they want to go onto your side, but they're afraid of failing. That's the problem. You gotta talk to them. The other part is, so this is the, this is the lesson. You gotta teach them to fail faster. When I was talking to BK the other night, he's created a system that allows you to fail faster. The more meetings you have, you fail faster. The more people you talk to, the faster you fail. The faster you fail, the more successful you become. And the reason I learned that is when I came back from Vietnam, 1973, you know, I, I had a decision. I'm going to talk to my, am I going to follow my poor dad's footsteps or my rich dad's footsteps? And in 1973, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to join my rich dad. And so my rich dad said to me, which is why you guys are here, if you're going to learn how to, to be an entrepreneur, you've got to sell. You've got to learn to handle rejection. You've got to learn to deal with people. And I said, oh my God, I don't want to sell. He said, then you can't be an entrepreneur. You know, my, to my poor dad, school teacher sells a four-letter word. And so I sat there talking to my rich dad. I said, is there another way? He goes, no. If you can't sell, you'll never be rich. You will never will be rich. A lot of A students are not rich because they can't sell. They can't handle rejection. And I said, I don't want to do it. He says, okay, well, you're not going to be rich. So here I am, 1973, a Marine pilot, you know, thinking I'm John Wayne. He says, Robert. My rich dad said, he says, so you don't want to sell? I said, no. He said, let me ask you a personal question. I said, what? My rich dad says, how's your sex life? <laughs> I said, pretty bad. He says, because you can't sell. He says, worst of all, Robert, if you never learn to sell, you won't be rich, and you'll never get laid. <laughs> so it's one of those life-changing moments, you know. <laughs> it wasn't the rich, it was never getting laid, it was like, I gotta go. Because I was one of these guys, you know, I was like, I'd be the guy at the bar, John Wayne, you know, pilot's outfit on thinking I'm, you know, Tom Cruise or something. But I'm so scared, I can't even walk up to the girl. I'm looking good and going home alone, you know? <laughs> so with that, my rich dad says, we'll learn to sell. So I said, okay. So that's why I got out of the Marine Corps in 74, and I got hired by two companies, IBM and Xerox. And both had sales training programs, I took Xerox. And so I went to the Xerox, I went to the best sales school in uh, Virginia, you know, and all this, I came back to Hawaii, and I started to fail. And I failed because I'm still too afraid. And I fail, 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 so they sent me back to school again. More training, but I still fail because I'm still too uh, afraid. And I'm sitting there going, holy Christ. And what my rich dad said to me, he says, Robert, how many sales calls do you make a day? I said, three. He says, you have to fail faster. And this is the key to success. Fail faster. So, so he said to me, he says, you've got to get your sales calls up to at least 30 a day. He says, you, you're, you know, 30. I said, how am I going to do it? He says, think, go ahead. So I went to work for a nonprofit at night. So I worked for Xerox and I make maybe three sales calls a day. And at night, at from 7 to 10, I would sit there dialing for dollars. Somebody told me they worked for a phone bank and all that. That's good training. 
So I set a goal every night. I was, gonna, I was gonna make 30 calls a night. Now I failed just as much, but ironically my money went up. I started doing better at work at Xerox. So the more you fail, the more successful you become. Everybody got that? Hello? So turn to your partner and say, fail faster. <laughs> Number two key to success is change. A lot of people want Mr. Obama to change or the tax laws to change, but one of the things I found out along my life was that I had to change faster. And one of the reasons I support network, um, network marketing, Success Magazine, all they do is because this organization is into personal development. Many people want the world to change, but you've got to change yourself first, okay? If you will focus on changing yourself first rather than blaming the world for your incompetence, you have a better chance of making it. So change first. Just last, last week, my wife Kim and I spend, you know, we're, we're seven days on a ranch in Texas on personal development ourselves. If I want to change the world, I change me. Okay? So the third thing, and, and that's why I'm, uh, when I came back from Vietnam, I got into a lot of trouble. I was still, I was in Hawaii, they, they stationed me back in Hawaii at, at Marine Corps Air Station, Kaneohe Bay, had one more year on my contract. And I thought I was John Wayne. And the, the problem I had was because I was so cocky, I got into a lot of trouble. And in my trouble, I mean, they, they have no sense of humor, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> just because I was flying drunk is no big deal, you know? I was machine gunning animals out of my helicopter. So when they caught me, I lied to them. See, there's nothing wrong with machine gunning animals out of a helicopter. Nothing wrong with flying drunk. Lying is a problem. Very big problem. It's a character flaw. So here I'm, I'm going to be court-martialed. I'm sitting there. It's a true story. I hate to, hate to tell you it's true, but it's true. And I was going to get court-martialed, and I was going to beat the charges. And a friend of mine says, that's the problem with you. If you beat the charges, you're still a liar. So with that, I went to a personal development workshop. Back then it was called EST, EST. Today it's called Landmark and stuff like this. Uh, there's also Tony Robbins and these guys. You know. So Tony, Tony, Tony used to be a partner of mine back in the 80s. Because I'm so much into personal development. If you can walk on fire with Tony, you can change anything. So. I went to this program called Est, and I found out what a liar I was. I went, holy mackerel. I've been lying most of my life, you know? So with that change, I came back in. I called the prosecutor up. I'm up on charges in Hawaii, you know, for fl flying, shooting, drinking. And I said, Captain Abrams, the guy's trying to send me to jail. He says, yes. I said, I'm coming in to tell you the truth. I was, really? I said, yeah, I'm going to tell you the truth. He said, are you nuts? Crazy. So I went all the way back to County O.E. Marine Corps Air Station. He sat me down, put up a, synopsis, you know, a court reporter, and I told the guy the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I said, I'm going to I mean, machine gunning animals was only a lightweight stuff I was doing. I was doing all kinds of other stuff. At the end of it, I think I lost 30 pounds, you know, like, because I'd been lying so much. And they said, I, said, I looked at the captain, I said, uh, I guess I'm going to jail, right? And the captain said, no. 
Thank you for telling the truth. You're out of here. So I got an honorable discharge and I was out. So, that's an example of for things to change first, I must change. And that's something I live by. So you guys are in a very important organization here because they're very much into personal development. But you have got to be willing to change. You cannot blame the system. You cannot blame them, the comp plan, the economy, the customer. It's only you. Everybody got that? Yeah. Congratulations. Okay. Number three. Mary. Marry bees and eyes. Don't make the mistake of marrying somebody on this side here. <laughs> if you are successful over here and you marry somebody over here, you'll know what hell is like. <laughs> so I want to bring up for you right now is my sweetheart. She's the author of the book here, Rich Woman. And it's my wife, Kim Kiyosaki. I know she didn't marry me for my money, because when we met, I was flat broke. None. Not, not only broke about half a million in debt from a previous business. I, I started the nylon and Velcro surfing wallet business, and we're very successful, but the business crashed, and I was, I was stuck with all the debt and in loans. So when I met her, you know, I was flat broke, and I said, I'm going to follow my dreams, and I'm going to move to uh, San Diego. So. Back in, back in 1985, what, four? four? End of 1984. We fell in love in 1984. 1985 was the worst year of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> but why don't you tell them about how good I became at selling and all that stuff? Yeah. I just, I just want to let you know, my rich dad was right, you know? I would say I'm lucky, but he's luckier. <laughs> so how many times did you turn me down? Uh, you asked me out for six months. She, turned, she said no for six frickin' months. If I hadn't gone through what I'm encouraging you guys to go through, rejection, pain, misery, humiliation. I mean, I... But it was worth it. Yeah. I saw, I saw her. She was living in Honolulu. I was living in Honolulu. I saw her. I thought, God has been good, you know, and all this stuff. And so I went to ask her out, and she said, no. So again, you know, all my sales training came in, and when I asked her again, she said, no. I asked her again, no. Six months of misery. Okay? Well, what happened finally? <laughs> obviously, obviously. Um, no, finally, he would send me cards, he'd send me postcards, he'd send me flowers, he'd send me balloons. Yeah, I was changing fast, wasn't uh, I? Yeah, he was <laughs> failing fast. It was changing. I tried, I tried begging, baby, please, please, you know, didn't work, try something else, you know. 
So when you guys are out there showing the business plan, be flexible, change, quick, say it differently. Okay? Keep yeah. So finally one night I'm like, oh, maybe if I just say yes, then he'll go away. So I said yes. And I pull up to your apartment on the beach. And uh, previous to that, he had asked my best friend at the time, who happened to be an old girlfriend of his. Wait, 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 wait. The plot thickens. Let me, let me explain here, okay, guys, here. When I said change, you know, I mean, I can't, so obviously this direct frontal assault, assault is not working. So I decided, I, said, I think I'll do some market research. I mean, she was worth it. I went, holy mackerel. Look at those legs. I said, that's it, man. So, so what I did was I called around and said, her name was Kim Meyer at the time. What can you tell me about Kim Meyer? Da, 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 da. Of course, my friend said, oh, she would never go out with you. I said, I shut up. You know? Anyway. So one day, they said, well, do you know who her best friend is? I said, no. And my friend said, she's your old girlfriend. I said, not really religious, but I dropped to my knees and said, thank you, Jesus. I appreciate this and all this stuff. <laughs> so I called my old girlfriend up. And she says, you scumbag, what do you want? <laughs> and she told you, you said, what, what is Kim like? And he says, oh, she likes walks. Well, what I don't like. What I didn't like is in, in, in Hawaii especially, the guys would go, oh, let's, you know, let's go out, let's go to the outer island. Okay, we're in Honolulu. Let's go to Maui. Let's go to Kauai. And we all women, we all know what that means, right? Yes. One hotel room. Yes. How many guys have tried that approach? <laughs> <laughs> so Karen says, oh, she just loves walks on the beach and champagne. That's her favorite thing. So what? All she likes a champagne and walks on the beach. I said, man, that's good, that's cheap, I can handle that. <laughs> okay, so he's done his market research. I pull up to his apartment, which happens to be a condo right on Waikiki Beach, a beautiful, beautiful building. And I get out of the car and there's a valet, there's a restaurant there, there's a valet, and I get out of my little yellow Toyota Celica and the valet comes up and goes, oh, you must be Kim. I'm like, yeah. Oh, Robert's expecting you. Let me show you to his apartment. Yeah, five bucks the valet was laying it on. Man. <laughs> so we go up to his apartment, we talk a little bit, and then we go down to the restaurant, which is the nicest restaurant in all of Waikiki, right on the beach. And we get there, and the maitre d' says, oh, Mr. Kiyosaki, we have your table right by the beach wait, ready for you. And the champagne is chilling. Okay. Making notes, that's good, like that. Okay. It was 25 I... bucks for the champagne, that was it. Then. <laughs> well, this was back in 84. And then, I, just, I just tell the truth here, the Mater D, in the middle of it, we're talking, and the Mater D says, oh, Mr. Kiyosaki, it's such a lovely evening. Why don't you and your date take your champagne and go for a nice walk on the... <laughs> Ka-ching! Score! I mean, <laughs> uh, and we have been together ever since. quick moment I just want to ignore I want to number one I just I'm so thrilled to see so many women here today yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I really believe you guys can start the women's revolution no doubt <laughs> what's that WPR <laughs> but um, I you know I wrote I wrote the book Rich Woman because I really, really believe and I'm really passionate about educating and encouraging women to be financially independent, business independent, and I don't think the women, let me ask the women, do you want to be dependent on somebody else? 
Men, do you want men, do you want the women dependent on you? Hey, whoa, right. We are in the right place. <laughs> so, so I was talking to a few women uh, right before we went on stage here and I asked them what was going on and, and they said, you know, sometimes it, it, being in business, I, I, we get a little intimidated or a little overwhelmed. Sometimes I feel like we're not being taken seriously. How many women have had that experience? Okay, great, good. Because I, I just want to say for me, you know, I started as an employee. I started in the E quadrant um, and then went to after I had an advert, I worked in an advertising agency, um, I got fired. I was not the, I really had a hard time being told what to do. Not fired once, fired twice, by the way. And then I went into advertising sales. And this is why I love this business. This is why BK and his whole team is doing such a fantastic job because when I went into advertising sales, I knew nothing. I had no training, no business training, no personal development training, and I had no support team. And those are the three things that you're going to get, that you're getting here now that, that I never had. And it really, I think this is why you're going to be, why there's so much success happening here are because of those three things alone. The support system, the personal development, and the business system. So, so I didn't have that and I'd go knock on doors and I was intimidated and I was scared and I was frustrated and when I got really frustrated, I'd pull out the little sex appeal card. You know what I'm talking about, women? Yeah. Oh yeah, I could, I'll flirt a little bit. Oh yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll go out to lunch with you. Sure, sure, sure. Yet, what I found out that did for me is, well, every time I did it, I felt like crap. You know, because I was saying to myself, I have to use this crutch. I'm not strong enough to have the skills and the talent and the guts to go out and do what I need to do. And it actually made me less of who I was, not more of who I, who I am. And I'm, what I'm getting here with all of you, the support that you're saying, you're, you're building up each and every one of you to be more of who you are, not less than who you are. Is that right? Good. Thanks. So I just want to say for the women, um, if you're, if, Sometimes if you get sound seems a little intimidating or a little overwhelming, sometimes you got to you know, reach down and, and make that change and fail faster and all of that. You've got to, you're also going to find your way to do it. You know, you're going to find your way because there's not one way. My way is certainly not Robert's way. You know, I'm not the Marine Corps way. Um, and your way is not, there's a lot of great leaders who have been speaking here today and they found their way to do it and you're going to find that as you go along. So I just want to say to the women and to everybody here, I, can't, I think you're in the right place at the right time. BK, you're doing a fantastic job in leading this company, and I just see great, great success for all of you. And I'm honored, honored to be here to, to speak with you today. And, and women, just go kick some butt. Thank you. Be careful, Kim, please. And yes, he is a good salesman. So what Kim didn't say, my, my first question to her is, what do you want to do with your life? And she says, I want to be an entrepreneur. And that's when I knew I had the perfect person. If she, if she had said, I want to be a housewife, it would have been aloha. Next one. <laughs> it was so much fun because I, you know, I, I didn't have any money when we... We uh, met because I lost my first business, but didn't stop her. She, we, she and I moved here to San Diego with nothing. We were homeless up on Del Mar Beach for about a week, but we kept going. She didn't quit on me. And then if, and by 1980, that was 1984, 1986, we got married, and we honeymooned right here next door to this hotel. So, so that was and it's now been... 27 years. Uh, so the final word is this. Push. I'll tell you a quick story. The one thing wonderful about the Marine Corps or flying is that they teach you emergency, 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 emergency. 
They want you to practice fail, 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 fail. So it was an agreement between my co-pilot and I, Ted Green, Lieutenant Ted Green, that every day we would fail more. So while the Marine Corps required us to fail four times, we would fail maybe 10 times a day on our, on our missions. So by the time we got to Vietnam, you know, we're pretty good at failing. And so on this one day, it's one mission we we're flying. We knew it was a 1972. We knew we were going to lose the war. And we were fighting for a village called Quang Tri, which is just south of the demilitarized zone. And it's really crummy, you know, because we, every, time, every time before the flight, I would go up on the deck and I'd ask myself, you know, if this is the last day, of, if tomorrow's the last day of my life, how do I want to live it? Do I want to live it as a coward or I'm going to kick ass tomorrow? You know, so, so I go down and then we take off. And so this one time we're flying around, the gunships go up first, then come the 46s, which are the twin rotors, and they load the troops on them. And the 46s start to lift. And it's really nervous. You can hear the da 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 you know, we've taken fire from here, and the, and the gunship is just flying around because we, we just escort the transports in. And then the Jolly Greens come up, the big, big ones, the Sea Stallions, and they start, that's when they put the bulk of the troops in there. So I'm flying around watching all this stuff. We're 27 miles out at sea off the coast of North, North and South Vietnam. And suddenly, out of the corner of my eyes, it's a Because in all the times I was practicing, this one advanced pilot, Captain Forrester, he says, when you see that thing go, stand up, bend over, and kiss your ass goodbye. You're going. There's no, you're, you're going down. I, went, I said, I hope, I hope it's not true. You know. <laughs> but because we had practiced so much, all of a sudden the engine goes, boom. Oh, 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 oh. And the thing goes, Phew. So now imagine a little, a little Huey. We have uh, two machine guns on each side, two waste guns with a total of uh, two, six machine guns, 36 rockets, ammo cans all over the place, and a crew of five. So when that engine went boom, all the warning lights go up. The thing goes. Shoom. Now, this is where preparation comes from. When that engine quit and the engine aircraft sunk, it was like, our first inclination is to pull back. That's the first pull back. Hope this is not happening. But what they trained us to do was push forward. In that split second, and I mean split second, is why I'm alive today. All those times practicing, 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 the moment that engine quit, everything in my body screamed, pulled back. But what they had trained us to do, push forward. That's my way of saying is, ladies and gentlemen, when doubt and fear and wondering, am I in the right place at the right time, that's signaling you're pulling back. Always remember, push forward call for help, ask somebody. Uh, <clears throat> what they said was the engine quit, and up until that moment, they said I sounded like John Wayne. The moment the engine quit, I sounded like a soprano, you know. Hi, baby, baby, baby. <laughs> going down, going down. <laughs> Thought I had a sex change up there or something. <laughs> but I still pushed forward. I held the thing forward. And pilots call it looking at the eyes of death, because I'm, I'm now looking straight down at the water coming up. And I'm going, jettison the guns. So they're throwing the machine guns off the side, kicking the rockets out, throwing the ammo cans out. The doors are coming off. And we're coming down at high speed. And just guide it. I'm watching. I'm, I'm marrying my needles. You know, this hole, 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 hole. I can see the water coming up. At the last minute, very gently. The aircraft comes like this, straight for the water, and goes shoo, shoo, and just glides. You know. To this day, I can still see the glide. Right? It's, it's, it's silent. Like, and all I'm saying to myself is, holy shit. You know? 
and come up, and then and airspeed's bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. At the last minute, pull back, rock the aircraft up, push the nose forward, pull hard. It goes, fumpa, 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 and it settles into the water. And the blade hits, tears the whole engine off, comes, comes through the cockpit, blows the cockpit apart, and we roll it. Now, not too proud of this, but um, Lieutenant Green's on the right, I'm on the left. So when I'm sitting there deciding, should I roll it to the right? <laughs> I rolled it to the right, <laughs> and I got out. The thing I, I can still see the water swirling around and coming out, going, and we're going down, you know, and pop, pop up. And I go one, two, three. So it's myself, two crew chiefs, two gunners, and one crew chief. And we go, holy, where's Green? Where's Green? Oh no, I killed Green. You know, and roll like going, and the water's boiling and all this stuff. Where's green? You know, you can't go down because the thing has sunk so far. Where's green? All of a sudden, hear this. You. <laughs> and I'm hugging him. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we're alive today. So we, when always remember this: when in doubt. Push forward. Thank you very much, you guys. <laughs>